you'll take your Bibles. Turn with me this evening to Psalms 119. It is the longest chapter of vision in the Bible. Let's start with verse 1. And go all the way through. 168. No, I'm kidding. Psalm 119, 105, if you will turn, turn there with me tonight. We are looking at back to the basics. And talking about the very first fundamental truth of the assemblies of God, we believe that the scriptures are inspired. We've been talking about the impact and effect of the word of God and especially the teaching of doctrine. And we will try to finish that up tonight. Doctrine is important, amen? amen. What we believe and why we believe it is so vital to the success of our Christian life. Verse 105, Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth. O, o Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And would you just speak to our hearts tonight? Cause us to be recipients of divine favor. Speak a word into each of our lives. Direct us. Holy Spirit, you have come to be our helper. You're, you've come to be our guide. The truth is the pathway that you will lead us in. And I ask you tonight, Lord, that you will answer unanswered questions for people in this room tonight. That you will speak boldly into their lives through your word. And may we all leave this place helped of God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three arenas when you talk about the word of God, the scriptures. Genesis to Revelation, the 66 books of our Bible. There is, number one, the standard of God's Word. <coughs> number two, there is the sovereignty of God's Word. And number three, there is the strength of God's Word. The standard of God's Word involves the fact that we must live by the Word of God and we must die by the word of God. We shall give an account of ourselves unto the Lord. We're living in a day and an hour when judgment seems to be a forgotten truth. But the writer of the book of Hebrews is so very emphatic when he said in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed once unto men to die, and after that, the judgment. Romans teaches us that we shall all give an account of ourselves unto God.
for the things that we have done in this life, whether they be good or whether they be evil. So the judgment is a reality, both for the saved and the unsaved. The unsaved will face the judgment called the great white throne judgment and will be judged for their Christlessness and their rejection of salvation through what Christ did on the cross. The church will stand before the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ in heaven, and we will give an account to God for the things that we've done for the Lord, those good things that we've done, and they will be judged on the basis of whether we did it out of love or whether there was some other motivation for them. Rewards will be given, and we will be assigned our place in the eternal kingdom of God and in the millennial reign of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ will allow us to discover uh, our arena of service for all eternity. The great white throne judgment, the sinners, those who have rejected Christ will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So the reality of judgment is a teaching of the Word of God. We cannot escape it, albeit we would like to defer it, we would like to put it off as long as possible, but the truth is, it is coming our way. What will be the standard of that judgment? It will not be the ideas or the embellishments of men concerning righteousness, but it will be the very Word of God that we will be judged by. So the standard of God's Word is so important. And while we are in this life, let us pay homage and tribute. Let us walk in obedience to the teachings of the Scripture, for they are those very issues that we will stand before God and give an account for. It is the only rule of faith and practice for the believer. The standard of God's Word challenges us in every area of our life. The words we speak, the things we see, and the feelings we sense. All of those are judged and challenged by the Word of God. The sovereignty of God's Word. The word sovereignty simply means uh, an all-consuming authority. When we talk about the sovereignty of God's Word, we're talking about the truth that it is forever settled in the heavens and it will not change. And it is therefore God's way of doing things. We must, we must acquaint ourselves with the ways of the Lord. God is all-powerful. He governs by His sovereign Word. It doesn't change. Matthew 24, 35 records the words of Jesus. The Lord Himself said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but My Word shall never pass away. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the prophet exclaims, The flower fadeth, the grass withers, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The sovereignty of God's word. And then thirdly, the strength of God's word. And I suppose I want to talk about that impacting aspect of the word of God in our lives. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, the Bible says that God's word is like a fire. And it goes on to say that it is even like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. The strength of the word of God is that of a hammer used to break the hardest stone to hew out of a mountain a building block a cornerstone for uh, the erection of a building. Uh, 
a hammer, the Word of God is, that will destroy uh, the rock-hard hearts of men. I don't know how many times I have seen the Word of God come into a person's life. What I thought was indestructible, what I thought was so difficult and challenging and hard, God's Word made quick business of it. God's Word can change the hardest heart. Take away a heart of stone Amen. and give us a heart of flesh. It can break through the walls of indifference. It can crush the rebellion of man's will. The Word of God, if we will sow it like seed in the good ground of, of a person's soul, that seed will not return void to God. It will not come back to Him empty. It will accomplish what God pleases for it to do. And God's intent for the Word of God is to challenge the heart of man and to change the heart of man and to break in pieces the heart of man. Hallelujah. The fire. The Word of God is like a fire. Jesus in uh, Matthew's Gospel has an encounter with John the Baptist. He is baptizing in the River Jordan. You will remember John says, the one who comes after me, talking about the Messiah, John is telling them that he is not the Messiah, that he's a forerunner, that he's the one preparing the way of the Lord. He's a voice crying out in the wilderness, make straight the Lord's path. And, and John says, the one that's coming after me is mightier than I am. His shoes I am not even worthy to stoop down and unlatch, talking about his sandals. He said, this one, I baptize with water. But this one that comes after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he said, this fire will burn up the chaff of sin. Amen. He goes on to say that the Holy Spirit will have a broom in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge the threshing floor. Talking about sweeping a floor filled with grain that has just been threshed or sifted. And the good grain has to be gathered and put into barns. And he says the Holy Spirit will take the broom, which is the Word of God, and he will sweep the good grain into the barn and it will be saved. And the chaff will be swept and thrown into a fire and it will be destroyed. I just want to say to you tonight that you can't separate the ministry of the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is integrally tied to the effectiveness of the Word of God. If the Word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit will watch over it and He will perform it. He will bring it to pass. Not one word that ever falls from the lips of Almighty God will lay quietly aside and accomplish nothing. It will never cease to be active. It will always be touched by the Spirit and God's Spirit will perform it and see that it comes to pass. Oh friend, confidently teach, preach, share, tell, de uh, declare the word of the Lord because when you do, the Holy Spirit will work with that word and He will bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Like a raging fire that cannot be stopped. Like a forest fire that has swept past all of the breaks. The wind constantly is blowing it and it cannot be put out. The fire of the Holy Spirit accompanies the preaching of the Word of God. And the Word of God consumes us, devours our sin, and brings righteousness into our lives. Hallelujah. The strength of God's Word is not only described in Jeremiah 23, 29 as a hammer and a fire, but Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus concludes His teaching on the Sermon on the Mount with that very last parable. It is the parable of the house builders. One man built his house upon the sand. Another built his house upon the rock. Both houses were probated, tested, by the winds, the waves, and the storm-tossed sea. And the Bible tells us that when the winds and the waves came against the house that was built on the sand, it fell and 
great was the destruction of it because it was built upon the sand. But oh, the one who built his house upon the rock, when the winds and the waves came against that structure, the Bible says it stood the force, the impact and the attack and the assault of the winds and waves because it was founded on the rock. The word of God is the sayings of Jesus. The word of God. Jesus said, if a man builds his house upon a rock, if a man hears my sayings and does them, he is like a man who built his house upon a rock. Hear me tonight, friend. The word of God is a stable foundation that you can build your life upon. We said it this morning as we were preaching about the teaching and of doctrine and, and, and the, the reason why we believe what we believe. Oh, God help us to have this stability in our lives. Uh, the world can't shake you. The world can't move you. The world can't challenge your faith to the point that you will give up or forfeit it if you are founded on the rock of God's Word. I'm telling you, the Word of God can stand the storm of life and time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12 says the word of God is quick, life-giving, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and the mara, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. The word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. Two-edged in the sense that it ministers not only the goodness of God, but also the severity of God. You see, the book of Romans tells us that God is multifaceted. We talk about God being love. He is. But because God is love, God is also justice. And so Paul tells us, behold, the goodness and severity of the Lord. And the Word of God ministers. Thank God it does. It ministers His goodness. It tells us of His greatness and power toward us. It tells us of all the wonderful things that God loves to do in the lives of people. It reveals to us God's abilities and God's ministry of kindness and mercies. But it also tells us the other side of the coin. It tells us about the judgment of God and the justice of God. And that there is indeed a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And that there is a judgment coming. And that we must flee from lust and fleshly lust. We must decide that we are going to be challenged in our hearts to give up sin and follow after the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The sword of the Spirit ministers the goodness and severity of the Lord. I don't think anybody can read the Bible if we truly read it with the help of the Holy Spirit and come away believing that God does not speak to us in both of those ways. That He ministers His goodness to us, but He also ministers His judgment and His justice to us. Psalm 107, verse 20. The Word of God tells us that God sent His Word and healed them. He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. The word sent is the Hebrew word shalak. And shalak is a word that is oftentimes used of an ambassador who is sent on a mission to represent a king to uh, implement uh, the ideas and the plans of a government, to work out some kind of uh, political uh, uh, deal with another nation. And so it has the idea of ambassadorship, one who is sent on a mission. And in that sense, God has sent His Word to heal us. He has sent His Word on a mission like an ambassador sent to represent a king, the word of the Lord has been sent to represent our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself 
became the Word manifest in the flesh. And His mission was as the ambassador of Almighty God to bring about the salvation of the world. There are three things that God sent His Son to do, and that is to convert us, to change us, and to comfort us. And oh, friend, I tell you tonight that Jesus has not come short in any one of those areas. He has been sent to convert us. Thank God by the power of Jesus' blood, we are converted. The word convert means not to just have a change of mind or a new way to think. It doesn't mean to just stop walking one way and turn in another direction. It literally means to have a complete metamorphosis. It means to, to be changed into another creature. The word metamorphosis or metamorphosize, it, it refers to the biological truth that a, that, that a tadpole uh, becomes a frog and that a, a, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly and, and a worm becomes a moth and so on as you see the change from one creation into another. Thank God for the power of Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is metamorphosized. He is changed. He is turned in to something totally different in creation. We are a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Can you say praise the Lord for the Word of God that converts us and changes us and comforts us. James chapter 1 talks about the strength of God's Word in its ministry as a mirror. Everybody say the Word of God is a mirror. Let's turn there just real quickly. James chapter 1. James. Right after the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, the perfect law of liberty is the word of God. Whoso looketh into the word of God, the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, in other words, becoming a doer of the word, living in it, abiding in it, meditating in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Hallelujah. The Word of God is a mirror. And as we behold it, we see the glory of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, as we behold the image of our Lord Jesus Christ in the mirror of God's Word, the Holy Spirit changes us into that image the image of Jesus. We must become those who do the Word of God. We cannot just hear it and expect it to change us. We must embrace it. We must uh, obey it. We must walk in its truths. And as we do, we are turned into that creature that is likened unto Jesus. That image, that visage of the Son of God. Real quickly, let me close tonight by giving you uh, these seven verses out of Psalms 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word gives us illumination. It is the principle of direction. Everybody say that with me. The principle of direction. God's word gives us direction in our lives. Uh, the psalmist writes in the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He leadeth thee. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. The concept of the Word of God is the principle of direction. Man is lost without the Word of God. 106 says, I have sworn and I will perform it. In other words, the psalmist is saying here, I have made a vow and I will do it. I will keep it. I will keep thy righteous judgments. You see, here is the concept of performing the word of God, of being a doer and not a hearer. So this is the performance of direction. Not only is God giving me his principle. But I am performing it. I am doing it. I am living it. And it is making a difference in my life. 107 says, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. It is the power of God's declaration that changes my life. The word quicken means to give life. I am afflicted very much. I am sick. I am weary. I am worn. I am mentally tired. That's what afflicted means. And, and, and here the psalmist says, Lord, quicken me. Touch me with your life according unto thy word. In other words, your word is the power of God that produces life in me. Verse 108, except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth. O oh Lord, and teach me thy judgments, the preparation of your dictates, the preparation of your dictates. Teach me thy judgments. I must learn them, not only with rote memory, reading them and studying them, but I learn them as I obey them, Amen. as I do them, teach me thy judgments. 109, my soul is continually in my hand. That means my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions is in my hand. I have control of my life. I can say what I will do and where I will go and what I will speak and what I will see and what I will do. Notice what the writer says. Yet do I not forget thy law. Amen. Powerful. Yes, you have a will. You have a right to choose. God will allow you that. But the psalmist said, even though my soul is in my hand and I have control to live as I would, I make my choices and my life is governed by your precepts, O oh God. I will not forget your law. How do you live an overcoming life? In the face of the attack of the enemy, in the face of the temptation of the flesh, you let the word of God rule and reign in your heart and life and mind. That is the priority of definition. The priority of definition. I do not forget that law. Verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. This is the passion of determination. You've got to be passionate about the Word of God. The psalmist said, I knew what was going on. I saw that my enemies had laid a trap for me. They had put a snare in my way. But in spite of that, in spite of knowing what they've done, I will not move from your precepts. I will not err. I will not run. I will not hide. I will not walk away from my responsibility to honor your word. Friend, there are challenges every day when people around us or the situations or circumstances of life challenge us to do things that we know are not righteous, things that we should not say and things that we should not participate in. The only way that we can make sure that we walk in righteousness is that we allow our hearts to be controlled by 
the law and the boundary of God's word. Hallelujah. Be passionate about it. Don't be nonchalant. The flesh will take over. But if you'll be passionate about the word of God, the Holy Spirit will give you strength to walk in his ways. Hallelujah. Verse 111 says, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I said it this morning, I've come too far to turn back now. Most of my life is behind me. A lot of us in this room are in the same boat. We have more history than we have future. I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind. All the days of my life. I'm going to walk in the ways of the Lord. Amen. I've come too far to give up. I've turned too, come too far to turn back. God's way is the right way. Yes. Amen. God's way is the only way. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. In other words, Lord, your ways are the inheritance of my life. I will rejoice in them. We're talking about teaching the Word of God. There is an oncoming generation. Who will teach them God's truth? We will. We will either do a good job of it or we'll do a terrible job of it. And you do it by making the Word of God your lifestyle. The perpetuation of delight. That's what verse 111 teaches us. Thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It is the rejoicing of my heart. I will continually abide in your ways. The perpetuation of delight. I will live in front of those that I come in contact with. Every day I will live my life for Jesus. By the way I live, by the words I see, by the deeds I do, I am perpetuating the doctrine of the Word of God. I would rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. The most powerful display of the Word of God is in the life of a believer who walks in the light of Jesus Christ. And concluding verse 112, I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. And the word end there deals with eternity, the passing from this life into that that God has prepared for them that love him. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes. Lord, I've always lived by your word, and I will do it even unto the end. When I step out of this life into the life that is to come, that is the perfection of our destiny. Do you really believe that at the end of life, there is God's reward for all those who have been faithful to Jesus Christ? I believe that with all of my heart. That's why I get up in the morning and, and, and determine that today is going to be a Christ-filled day. Today is going to be a day lived for Jesus. Regardless of what happens in the circumstances of life, today is my opportunity to live for Him and to glorify Him and to let His Word be a declaration in my life. I hope that's the way you choose to live. You'll make an impact wherever you are for God. People's lives will be touched. You will perpetuate the Word of God in a new generation coming on. Every chance I get, I talk to my grandchildren about Jesus. And I get to talk to them on their level about the Word of God. And I tell them why we do this and why we do that. And why we talk like this and why we do the things that we do. I want them to know. They have a responsibility before God, even as small children growing up. Teach them the ways 
a reward that when they're old, they'll not depart from them. Hallelujah. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us just continue to make a commitment to follow after the word of God. The closing moment of this service. How many of you as believers tonight would stand and say, Pastor, I know what I believe. And even some of it I know why I believe. But I want to make a fresh commitment to the Word of God to be a student of the Bible. To love its truth. To search it out and to discover the wise. See, God always makes sense. He is the truth. And His ways are the right ways. And I want us to get to the place to where we have such a passion his word not legalists but people that are walking in the spirit fulfilling the word of God walking in love ministering the word of God that's the kind of force that's going to change the world and reach people for Christ Pastor, I know what I believe, but I want to get to the place where I'm a, a student of the Bible, where I know why I believe what I believe. To walk in the precepts and the ways of God. To understand the teachings of Scripture. That takes a commitment, a lifetime commitment, to pursue the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the great teacher. He'll instruct us if we'll do that. How many of you would stand and say, Pastor, I believe, I, I, I know what I believe, but I want to pursue that walk with God where I know why I believe what I believe. The Holy Spirit's help, I'm going to do it. With the Holy Spirit's help, I'm going to follow Jesus. Even unto the end. Even unto the end. The day when we are made perfect in that great destiny. And say that to God. Lord, I'm going to pursue you with all of my heart and make the Word of God my passion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love your law. I love your precepts, Lord. Your commandments and your statutes are the rejoicing of my heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Testimonies of the Lord are true, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honey comb. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Illuminate our hearts, O oh God, as we serve you with all our hearts. Thank you, Lord. The enemy had laid a snare for me, yet I will not forget thy precepts. My soul is in my hand, yet I will not err from thy ways, O oh God. <coughs> How many of you can say tonight, I will make God's choice? my choice. See, God's choice is His Word. I will make God's choice my choice. I will align my thoughts with the thoughts of God. That's God's Word. What God thinks is what God's Word is. I will think like God thinks. I will feel like God feels. How do you do that? You get full of His Word.
Would you just slip your hands up to God tonight in the closing moment of this service and say, Holy Spirit, take the Word of God and minister it to me. Let me grow in the Word of God. Let me grow in the things of the Word. Let me be a capable communicator of the Word. Let me get to the place, Lord, where I can share my faith in a powerful way as I pursue the Word. Holy Spirit, stamp the Word of God upon me, upon my mind, upon the tables of my mind and my heart. Oh, Holy Spirit, write the law of God, not upon tables of stone, but upon tables of flesh. I bind them to my hand and my wrist. I bind them to my forehead like the old Jews. Lord, that I may not forget thy ways. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you.